everybody talks about community now, but um, but literally the idea of human beings who are like a set or a tribe or a group or whatever, that's what we were trying to document. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set. This week, part two of my conversation with Ian Mackay. During part one, Ian talks about growing up in D.C., his early musical experiences, and co-founding the influential Discord Records. If you want to hear more about the history of Discord, make sure to check out our episodes with Ian's label mates, Brendan Canty, Amy Farina, Mitchell Feldstein, Laura Harris, Zach Brokus, Adam Wade, Pete Moffat, and Chad Moulter, all available for free on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. And now, part two of my conversation with Ian Mackay. I would have to imagine that at some point, the label transitioned from being just a vehicle for you to release music to being a company of some sort. You, you hired people and yeah. you were responsible to other people, mm-hmm. and then people are entrusting you with their most precious work and you're helping them kind of usher it into the world. When did you start regarding it more as like a business? Um, well, in 1983, we started to pay taxes. So we were, and you created a company on paper at that point. Well, we're a partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Discord records is a partnership. Yeah. Um, but we had to do that because there's no way we were just getting, yeah, we just got to a point where we had to do it. And then, I mean, at that point, though, by 1983, I mean, think about it. Like, <clears throat> the first record was the Teen Idols. Second record was SOA. That was Henry. Henry used his own mind to put that out. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, you have that. And then he says, any money that comes back, you just keep it, put it in the label. So he just donated that money. He just wanted to have his own record. He wouldn't. He didn't want to wait for us to get the money back. So he just put the money in and said, Henry was like one of the founders of the label in many ways. Then the Minor Threat single comes out. And that was, you know, pretty sick. That, those records, people were psyched. Then we do GIs. Were you psyched? With that record? Yeah. Yeah. Were you proud of it? I don't proud. I don't use the word. I'm not pride is not a word I use, really. Why not? Um. Because it's it's a it's a it's a it's a reflective quality that I don't really. Uh, Were you able to enjoy it? Like listening back, did you feel like yeah, that was okay, good we did something good. I, yeah, but not in the way you're thinking, probably. Well, I'm thinking like you're that thinking, lots of people. Um, I'll never be able to hear like for me if I listen to like the Pink Flag Wires Pink Flag album. Yeah, like that to me is like a, a perfect record. Right. Now, I don't know if Minor Threat is like that. Minor Threat is interesting because. Enough time has passed where I've kind of forgotten about the actual recording so I can hear it from an external point of view. Yeah. Like, I do think the Meyer Threat, like, I think that stuff is, like, the first Meyer Threat, I do remember thinking the Meyer Threat single was like, that is great. Like, I was so happy with it because it seemed, it just seemed perfectly balanced. You know, I love the way the bass and the guitars work together and, and uh, but it was so off, it was just the way we were. They were those guys were good, and I'm not talking. I'm talking about the three of them, like Brian and Lyle and Jeff were. I didn't know it, but they were just su- they were super good at what they did. Like it took me years because I was in it, so I didn't know. But then I remember there was some in the early 2000s. I was making a DVD of the Minor Threat live video, so I was. I had a couple different shows and I was organizing this DVD and I was in a studio working with it and, and you know, fixing the sound and getting the sync right. So I really studied. I was watching them play. And also, at this point, I had been playing guitar for many years in Fugazi. So I was watching them play and realizing, like, I had never seen them because I was From in the, the outside. band. Yeah, I was yeah. in the band. Yeah. I'm looking the other direction. And I'm watching them and I realized it's like, they're, it's like science fiction the way they play. Like Jeff's drumming is he's n- great, unbelievable, insane drummer. Does he and play anymore? Not really, no. And Lyle Pressler, that guy is one of the I think one of the most unappreciated guitar players. He played full bar chords at a lightning speed, and his precise like precision the rhythms are great. And I, you know, 
it's all, you know, but that didn't really occur to me until many years later. Cause I was in the band, you know, I just didn't think about it. Um, so, but anyway, pride, pride is not, I, that's, yeah. yeah, I don't really go there, but I, yeah, I was happy with that record. And in my eyes, I thought it was good. But the point being that we were, it took a while. Each record was kind of painstaking because we had to wait for the money to come back. Right. We had to pay COD for the records, mm -hmm. cash on delivery. But then you sell them to distributors, they could take like six months to pay you back. And then they send some of them back to you if they don't sell or it. Or they too. don't pay yeah. you. Yeah. And they go out of business, which happened. And we, they, we got like, they one a bunch of distributors went out of business at one point and I don't know, it took $900 and it crushed us. Yeah. I mean, it sent us into deep, like we were so in debt and pointless at that point. Um, but, uh, so it wasn't, so then, but then we started getting checks and we had to have a, a bank account for it. And we were, and at some point where I guess we got to do a real partnership. And that's when I said, we started paying taxes in 83 and then records just started selling. Yeah. You know, and, and so at that point, you know, and then we started, when, by the time I was in Fugazi, I was touring so much. We had to have people working, you know? Mm -hmm. So most people who worked here were volunteer to begin with, like Amy Pickering and Cynthia Connolly. And, you know, we all just volunteered, you know, you get food. But Jeff and I, for instance, didn't draw any money really until 1988. You just had jobs. Like mm -hmm. I, when I was what, in my, what were your jobs? Um, I, I worked, know you worked at Hagen Dazs and at a movie theater. Yeah, the movie theater, Georgetown Movie Theater, Hagen Dazs, and um, I, for a while I was typist for this company called Arcasis. It was a educational theater company that, that was a short-lived gig, but um, I used to type the same letter over and over and over and over to different schools trying to sell this educational musical theater thing. Um, but I had a, um, I worked, and I drove a newspaper truck for a while. He saw, um, Rich Moore, who was a drummer in The Untouchables, and then uh, later he was drummer in Double O, and other, he sang for a band called Second Wind. He lived here at the house, Discord house, and he had a, he drove a newspaper truck Washington Post truck, you deliver bundles, and I did three nights a week. That was good money. I liked that job a lot. Um, and then I started doing, then I worked at Yesterday and Today Records for five years, and I um, I did production work. So that meant, um, like, like, you know, carrying, you know, the Cures amps or whatever. You know, I did you mean all that. production work at concert venues? Yep. Yeah. You name an 80s band, I probably did the gig. You know? Probably carried their amps. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I mean, I carried, you know, uh, I saw the Smiths first, Washington, their first tour, and they, I remember the, the show at the, um, was it the Warner? I think it was the Warner Theater. And uh, kids were going so crazy for Morrissey and, we had to get them from the back door to the bus. They just had a regular kind of bus, as I recall. It wasn't even like a rock bus. But we had to get them. There's all these kids out there. And we had to get from the back door to the bus. The security guy, they formed like a wedge. And I was willing to pick up the back of the wedge. Sort of the big guys were in the front. And they would have to drill their way through with the crowd. And then we were in the back to kind of deflect kids trying to get up from behind. And... Um, Right before we went out the door, I said to Morrissey, I said, maybe I should carry your hat for you. Because he had this bolo hat on or something. And uh, he's like, oh, that's that's a nice idea. And then he handed me the hat. And then we just drove through the crowd and got on the bus. And I handed him it. I go, your hat, sir. And he says, that was a wonderful idea. And I was, I talked to Johnny Marr about this. And he remembered this. Oh, wow. Yeah. I said, yeah, it was the guy that carried the hat for Morrissey at that show. <laughs> um, but... Um, so I did that kind of work. Yeah. I did all the, so that. And then in 1988, you started drawing checks from the partnership. Yeah, but not, I mean, pretty modest. So you were still working at that point, other jobs. I quit, that, that's when Fugazi, that's when Fugazi yeah. got busy. Okay. In 1988, you can look at Fugazi, like the Fugazi Live series site, you'll see, we just started working. Mm -hmm. And we were touring so much. Yeah. So I, it was, the working for other people was out at that point. Mm -hmm. And you were about 26 at that point. Exactly. When you were working those jobs, uh, it sounds like you were kind of engaging and having a good time and drawing whatever I enjoyment you could out of it. I liked them all. So it, it wasn't ever like this ambition of, okay, I wish I could just get my band going and then I don't no. have to work anymore. I've never, ever thought about making money from music. Mm -hmm. 
Like, so what people. happened when you started making money from music? I make music for my work. I don't make music money for my music. But when money was being generated from it, were you suspicious of it? Uh, no. Do you feel like your kind of entrepreneurial talent was ever at odds or um, did it ever feel like counter to the spirit of punk rock? No. No. Not at all. I mean, to me, it's it's all... I believe like in a practical art. Like yeah. I like the idea of things working. I feel like that all, everything should work this way. Like I believe in the middle class. Yeah, I'm not rich. Yeah, you know, but I can get by, and there's a way to do this. People talk about patrons of the arts. Like so much of art and music is hung up on the idea of somebody very, very rich investing in you, mm-hmm. whether it's a person or a company. Right. Right. Somebody who extracts value out of society and then throws a little bit back. Right. That's what the you know the patron of the art. I just believe in the idea of like musicians and artists create a necessary, a necessary component for life. Like it's something that's absolutely necessary in life, and they should be taken care of by other people who are happy to share a little. A lot of people who would share a little. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's, you know, so the idea is, I don't think, I've, no, I've never thought it was counter punk at all. To me, the idea of what punk is actually taking a model, like looking at the record industry's model, and then just thumbing your nose at it and saying, like, we can do this our way. Well, yeah, it seems punk. like basically what you did is you took the record label and took the banana seed off of it and made it more utilitarian so you could jump it in the forest. I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, for instance, if profit is not your motive, yeah, then you're free. Yeah, and that's what I seek to be free. So profit Do is you not feel my free? motive. Yeah, I feel pretty goddamn free. Yeah, I mean, I have. A, it's interesting. The label is now. We just it's 38 years right now. Yeah, right. We first record came out December 1980, um, and there was a, about eight or nine years ago. Um, you know, I was thinking about the label and like how long I've been doing it and how long we, we've been, you know, working away in this thing. And I thought, man, this is a, you know, getting, we're creeping on a half a century now. And, um, and as you know, like, I mean, the label, <clears throat> first off, record, the industry itself is um, always changing. Digital stuff is created. Like the idea of music as content has really, subverted record industry records sales and stuff sure. like if it's just content then people just subscribe to channels and they stream things it's just like filler right, so like, sawdust yeah. wallpaper right, so, yeah, so you're just part of their Stream. their operation and they'll yeah. kick you some pennies sure I and mean, really now the way like whereas before it was very much like it fit in with my my sense of business which was you make a record you do well with it and then you sell it and you get paid for the record there's an exchange there whereas now it's just more like there's a wall and you just like you put you drive a tap into it and you might squeak some some pennies out of there mm-hmm. there's all this money on the other side of this wall mm-hmm. that's what the in record industry is now right you just tap in to all these different weird income streams yeah and that's where the money comes um it's no longer like i don't have to do anything like while we're talking i've made some money yeah whereas before i mean we made the fucking records right we would in the first records we literally would cut fold and glue the sleeves ourselves Mm -hmm. that was record industry you know and we would put them the records together and then we would take them and sell them to people that was like and then they would give you money and you would understand that exchange whereas now you know it's just sort of this weird theoretical money like you have some numbers on a on a computer screen that go up because somebody somehow injected some more numbers into your number Mm-hmm. Um, and that has nothing to do with any, there was no glue, no f- paper cuts whatsoever. So that right. feels it's weird to me. But um, the, the most important thing about Discord is that the Discord as a label was documenting a particular community. That was always the mission. That's why it was only DC. Um, and in the beginning, that community was very easy to define because it was just sort of our click A, right? Our, mm-hmm. our set. And, um, and then it started to spread because the, the punk scene got bigger here and it got very big here um it became more like 
we didn't know everybody. And then right. there was other sets and other clicks and And then and, other generations coming right, up. Well that comes along. So then yeah. you're like so then you're like I'm like, well what what does our community mean? But then when you start having bands like I remember Q and Not You, that band Q and Not You yeah. came along and they grew up listening to sure. us. So aren't they wouldn't they qualify certainly as a community? Like that's that's community. So it's been it's very it was interesting how that kept changing. In the beginning it was sort of like us and then it was like our siblings and then it was like our siblings friends well, and it it's was, like your label was right, expanding its right. own and circle. then people came to washington because they liked their label you yeah know, like, i did that right <laughs> right you know a lot of people did and then there was and and um and then there was it was just this weird like thing but the point of the root of it all is this idea of a community and i use that word I try to use it sparingly because it's been so abused by society or by the by the marketplace now. Like yeah. you know, there's like everybody talks about community now, but um, but literally the idea of human beings who are like a set or a tribe or a group or whatever. That's what we were trying to document was this, um, and ultimately they're people, and people are mortal. They will die, yeah. and when they die, um, it uh, which is. Part of the plan, second most natural thing in life. Um, second uh, most, right behind birth. Yeah, they're not Every, equally. They're not equally as natural. Well, one can't happen without the other. Right. So I give birth first place, but eventually the people will die. It would logically seem the community would die, and eventually the label will die. I'm totally fine with that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, then the but, planet will die one day. <laughs> well, yeah. But the point being that I was sitting here thinking. This is some years ago. I was thinking about like, wow, this is you know, like what's going on here? Because like you know, obviously it's also diminishing returns, right? Because we're getting farther away. Kids today are not that interested in what was happening fucking forty years ago, right? Like think about it. In nineteen eighty one. Yeah, were you like, listening to bebop records right, from the forties? No, exactly, right. So I think that I've told people that like when people are like really super into punk now and they tell me about it, I'm like it's hard for me to relate because like in 1941 like I was 19 sorry 1981 I was not thinking about what was happening in 1951 or if like I mean, we're talking about even it just would be weird like the, our model was not that but there are bands today who are really like still super influenced which is great I'm not but I also think now there's a, there's a glut of information where you, right, it's you have access to that right it's a different circumstance but mm-hmm. at the time it just was weird like we wanted the new idea Mm-hmm. We weren't trying to recreate an idea. Yes, it's far. It's far in a way I desire. Still life to aspire. When I run out of things to do, I do myself. Can you stay? Be still. Be silent, will you obey? Too much movement When I run out of things to do I do myself It seems fine here But every here has a there Do you think that the music industry is any better or worse? No, off the same, now. Oh, off? Yeah. What is do you it, mean? If the goal is to put music out into the world, is, has it gotten any better or worse? No, I think it's the same. It's just different tools. Mm-hmm. It's good. That, that, there's just yeah. To I think people same, have a thing. tendency to bemoan, um, you know, change, especially when whatever model they grew up. Oh, I don't. With, not, I'm not one of those people. Yeah, I'm not. A, I don't have any kind of. I have no. I mean, I can. We can. There's certain aspects of every sure. medium that sure. are that are that I think I prefer. Like, and and you've and, thrown and, me off my very good yeah. point. I was going to make you just yeah. pull okay. me off. Sorry. I'm going to go off now yeah. a little bit because you did that. Um, um, because I was going to give you a good something to think about, but now we're going to we'll, talk about we'll, something. We'll different. hit that too. So, um, you know. Like, for instance, like, I grew up on record, obviously. I loved record. And then CDs came along, and I thought CDs... I, I liked CDs f- for a myriad of reasons. Um, they were, um, like, especially in terms of bootleg, the bootleg world, like, such 
such superior it's much easier to make a cd than a, than um than vinyl bootlegs and so you could get this much much better sounding stuff but what cds didn't have and you're probably more of a cd well you're maybe even cassette i uh, yeah i was i grew up i was born in 80 so when right. i was a kid you know i got vinyl was my first right but then um, when I started being able to buy things with my own money, I could buy tapes. Right. Yeah. So that's okay. So, right. Well, th- but here's the thing about CD, for instance. Like, what CDs don't have is sides. Vinyl has two 15 to 20 minute sides, and that's digestible. Yeah. Right? And quite often, you would listen to one side or the other, and you really get to know the record in terms of it being an album. Like a, co- a collection of songs that have been curated and sequenced in a certain way, and they each side have its own personality. Yes. Where CDs were just one side, and because you could put seventy minutes on, quite often they would put seventy minutes worth of music on it, um, and it became you, no one can you can't digest seventy minutes of music in the same way. It's just hard. We're not you yeah. can't, but it's much more difficult. So each medium has its shortcoming. I would say digital stuff now, like I think like MP3s, I don't think sound good. They're very convenient. Mm-hmm. They're very convenient in terms of zinging sounds around for people to check out. But really, they just, I mean, the compression on them, to me, it leaves you, it leaves you, it leaves you wanting. I do think that when you, with any kind of art, whether it's visual or audio, if you drill down to the very root of it and it's a square, it's going to have, it's going to have a problem spiritually for you like it's not mm. going to work with your heart on some level for me that's what i do love about analog interesting a, yeah yeah it's not a square at the root it's like a it's, it's a wave <laughs> it's, it's something round you know it yeah. you know that's the so the um but i'm that's me i like imperfections mm-hmm. i like the human heartbeat i like i i would much rather hear a drop note than a um than a um than a, 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 a auto-corrected one and um uh I just think it's more interesting. But getting back, so I'm not a formatist. So I understand each person has their own, where they come from. I listen to, in the car, I listen to CDs because I like the way they sound and I don't. I have an old car and that's what's in there. At home, I'll listen to vinyl. Here, I'll listen to a computer. I don't really give a fuck. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. I think if the art itself is profound, then you can be moved by it. Right. Well, also, remember, that all recording is just it's an just abstract a rep- it's just representation. Exactly. It's just an abstract exactly. And, and I'm sure that um, it's also know, a sonic illusion. That's what recording is. Yeah, sure. It, same thing with the film. It's a visual illusion. You know, when you're watching a film, it, it's not actually moving. We're watching still frames right, put exactly. together right. at 24 frames a second, right. and that's cool. I right. think illusions are exciting right. and fun. Yeah, and I still get, and I still believe them. Yeah, like, I love it when I get lost. I, I mean, or even if you look at a book, you know, it's you're looking at letters. It's an abstract representation of an idea. Right, but of course, this follows my concept yeah. of artists being translators. Yeah, because you know, all artists, whether like, if it's a musician, they hear something and they want you to here's what I'm hearing, and they re- 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 reproduce it in their lang- in their language, or if they're visual, then they, this is what I see, and they reproduce it in their form, or if they're writers, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, so these things are all, so it's similar kind of thing. Yes, there are just representations. And, um, the other, another thing that's interesting to remember is that the music industry has only existed for about 100 years anyway. Yeah, and, exactly. and before that, if you wanted to hear music, you played music or went to see a musician play. Have you, you, know, never, what, you ever heard me say that before? Uh, no. Really? But that's been that's my, what I think about I've been, all the time. I have been on that. I've been, that has been my rap for ages. It, it wasn't really until electricity came along yeah. that it was even possible yeah. to buy music. They don't. Say, sure. But. But I said, like, ultimately, what people need to understand by the record labels, like the industry, that, you know, until recently, what it was they were selling. Do you know what they were selling? What? What do you think they were selling? What was the record industry really selling? What was really what they were selling? So, not music. No. Plastic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Vinyl. That's exactly what they're selling. Which is actually... That's exactly what they're selling. If you and I were sitting here and we had mugs, right? Yeah, right. And I had a plain mug and you had a, a mug with some kind of logo on yeah. it. Like, if we went to the store, your mug might cost more than mine. Because mm-hmm. mine is plain, right? Mm-hmm. The reason it costs more is that, that people whose logo it is are being paid a license 
mm-hmm. to make that mug identical mug by the way just mm-hmm. one has a Functions logo on exactly it. the same right exact same thing except yours is more expensive because it's more in some people's mind it's made more attractive by the inclusion of that logo and then the yeah. people who own that logo have been paid a license to use that logo sure. And then as a consumer, you have to decide if having that logo on your mug is going to enrich your day by right. drinking out of it to a degree commensurate with whatever you're right. paying right. extra So now for look it. at vinyl, yeah. the record label. Yeah. They all sold essentially uniform pieces of plastic. Yeah. Right? With All made in the same factory. Basically. Yeah. And with the same technology, essentially. What's different is, is that they have different information in groove in the grooves that have been pushed into that vinyl, right? Mm-hmm. And the grooves are filled with information that they have licensed from somebody yeah. to make their plastic more attractive than somebody else's plastic. Mm-hmm. That's all they're selling. Plastic and paper. That's what was on sale. And if you think of it like that, then it makes it very clear. Yeah. You know what's going on. And I'm a record label guy. So I'm not I I, yeah, I sure. we sold plastic and paper. Mm-hmm. So we the way we sold it, we made it, you know, our aesthetic was really like it appealed to some people and it didn't yeah. to other people. Would you say that there is uh, an aesthetic through line to, when it to comes what? to your label? Yeah. How would you define it? I think that we've always tried to cue rather closely to the idea of documenting something that was happening here in Washington, D.C. And ideally, that we were trying to document something that had happened and we weren't trying to make something happen. Mm-hmm. Which is this is an inversion of the way most record labels work. I mean, if you think about it, like the term that when people they tour behind an album, right, right, or they're touring on behalf, of, like there's a new record out, so they have to go on tour to promote it. Well, that's how it used to be anyway. <laughs> well, but that's but that was you know, or yeah. whatever. But it yeah. still is. They still put out a record as a way to. That's like the idea, but it makes the record Seems backwards. It is backwards because it makes the plastic. This inanimate object, it makes it the it point. puts that up on a pedestal. That's what it is. That's what we're in service. And to. then, there's and the, then, and then, there's an expectation to recreate the experience of the record in the live show. Like, oh, it, they sounded just like the record. Isn't that amazing? Maybe. Yeah. yeah it might be. I haven't thought about that. I'm taking that far, but mostly to me, it's an inversion that you would tour to promote the sale of something because it makes the sale of something the point. Whereas we always looked at it opposite. Right. We put our records to support the tour. Right. We won, and with Fugazi had this mantra, like the show, they said the record's the menu, the show's the meal. That was, we said that over and over, the record's the menu, you give people an idea of what you do, and then you go show it to them, they're like, whoa, that is so, like now we know what these songs are, and then we see them live, and you see what, what possibility exists in a moment, right, when you hear those songs as they're being performed. And they're unique in that moment, right? Because they're responding to that room itself. You know, we're the band that never used a set list, right? So we always were, we always built, and we were trying to be responsive to the circumstances. Um, but I want to go back to the label thing. Cause yeah. Because you, you pulled me off of this. Um, so about 10 years ago, I was thinking about this label, how the, the diminishing, like the label is getting smaller. There's le- I mean, we were selling, there's a time we were selling hundreds of thousands of records. You know, now if we sell, you know, I mean, our best selling records, our worst selling record back then would be eight or 10,000. Now our best selling are a thousand. So it's clearly like, you know, things are slowing down. That we have a very deep catalog and people are still are interested in that stuff. Meyer Threat and Fugazi are definitely the drivers of the, of the label. Um, but at some point I was like, well, maybe I, I need to get out of this, you know. But then I realized that, oh, wait a minute. I have a custodial responsibility at this point because <clears throat> for the last over three decades, close to four decades, all of these people have entrusted to me like this music, this work they did. And we've never used a single contract with anybody, no contracts, nothing. So this is pure trust. They have entrusted to the label the 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 there's music to make it available to people for as long as it, people want to hear it. Like that's like that's they've said they've trusted us and they've made my I have an unusual life and it's made possible by these people's trust. Mm-hmm. Right. Um so I realized, oh, now I have a custodial responsibility to do that. For as long as there's an interest, I have to figure out a way to make it like available to them in one form or another. And in the case of two bands specifically Meyer Threat and Fugazi. 
and to be clear, as you know, I'm in was in both bands, so there's this is a little bit of a you know it's a little tricky. But speaking as a label, like those two bands are far and away the biggest band on a label, like by a factor of ten. Mm-hmm. Like I think our best selling record behind. I don't know what it would be, but probably sold 50,000 records or something like that. But Fugazi has sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of records. Millions? Threat, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. collectively, sure. Yeah. yeah. And Meyer Threat, I mean, it's hard because there's different formats, but if you were to take sure. the first single. It's basically like right. a, a, it's a rite of passage type of record right. now. Yeah. I mean, that record, if you, take the first, I mean, if you take the first single and then the various different formats that that's been reissued on and add that, that's a million. Like that's been a million copies of that, so I feel like that those those are far and away the biggest selling records. So I feel like those two bands, especially, we have a responsibility to as a label. Of those two bands, one of them broke up in 1983, and we broke up in 1983. Our best selling record had sold 3,500 copies. That was out of step. Maybe we start on the second pressing of it, maybe, but. Not that many records. So those, all those hundreds of thousands came after the fact. Yeah. And we broke up where there's no interest in us from any other label. But Fugazi was selling hundreds of thousands of records and had been approached by numerous labels mm-hmm. and offered, in theory at least, offered serious money, which the band, you know, and I, and I had to, of course, recuse myself since I was in the label. You know, I couldn't be... Part of it, but the band was unanim- unanimously was like we are staying with Discord, so I feel like that this label has ultimately, like we are we owe it to Fugazi especially that that last the last hour we spend will be spent making a Fugazi record, and I feel like that is the sort of the mission of the label now really is to uh, to be custodial to really think about to not do anything that would subvert or or cheapen. The, the the um sort of the 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 aesthetic of the label like not to do you know to not suddenly like you know sell it all off for advertising or whatever you know that sort of thing or but not also not to sell it I mean, yeah. at some point I'll die and then you know it's out of my hands but um well do you have a will in place I with have, like know, a plan for what I, would not, happen first to all, the it's label not, it's Jeff and I own the label yeah so it's not it's so um. It's very hard to articulate that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you can suggest, but you can't force people to do things. Right. Especially you don't have a lawyer. Oh, you don't have a lawyer? No. Never had a lawyer. Why not? Why? That's how I'm in business so long. <laughs> but that's you, you understand that you're an outlier in that sense. I mean, most people I'm an don't outlier own. in most senses. Yeah. 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 Um what I are, have friends who are lawyers. Yeah, and you've never asked them for advice? Oh, sure I have, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what I do. I have family that are lawyers, and I'll ask them for advice. Yeah, but I don't, I think mostly, I think that I've tried to live in a life, I mean, to me... It's almost like if you invite lawyers into your uh, business practices, then it almost invites litigation later on. Well, that's what they do. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you, It's a, actually, I was just talking to, who was that? I was just reading a quote, and they said that... Um, they said armies don't armies don't cause war, but after a while, after all the training with the weapons, they want to shoot them. Yeah, and I think that's sort of the same thing with lawyers. Like they don't want. It's not like lawyers specific don't individually. It's not like that they want there to be a lawsuit, but they want to they want to go to court. That's what they've been training for. Mm-hmm. Um, but mostly, the expense like of lawyers like. Think about most labels. That's like a huge part sure. of it, and that's just been part of the way we've been able to. We've never had. A, we don't use contracts, so you don't have to have lawyers. So then, all that's out the window. I've been in partnerships where we didn't use contracts, and I've been in partnerships where we did use contracts. And one of the problems that arose with the partnerships that did not have contracts were that different parties to that partnership remembered agreements different ways and it caused big problems when, when money started coming in later on. Uh, So it's kind of remarkable to me that you've been able to thrive without using contracts. Well, I think for me, not using contracts means you have to be more thoughtful about who you would work with. Yeah. You have to trust them. You have to trust that you can be your friends and you can. Yeah. I mean, it also just so happens that the people with whom you worked when you were an 18-year-old kid 
happen to be trustworthy and that your relationships with them haven't been damaged over the years. Yeah, you could say like, oh, that was a fortunate thing. Or you could say maybe that was part of the work. Yeah. Then maybe I didn't work with the people yeah. who I couldn't. There were plenty of people around who I didn't trust, yeah. who I didn't work with. Yeah. Yeah. It so seems like words, you're also you know, probably a, a pretty intuitive person when it comes to that. I don't know. <laughs> you don't? Well, I might, maybe I am. I don't know. I can't. You know, it's hard for me to say. Did you have kind of guiding principles as far as how you wanted to conduct yourself as a label and as a business? Yeah, to be to be um, to be reasonable. Yeah, and and that meant I, I remember, but also not to be like we weren't trying to make money. Yeah, and and it also meant like in, I remember in the '90s you were one of the only independent labels that was offering health insurance to your employees. Still do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Seems seems reasonable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we're the, I don't know. Is that, to me, I I feel like um, oh, I don't. I just feel like you should take care of the people that you're who, who you're. Who, I don't know. Seems doesn't it seem? I mean, people say like, why did you guys char- charge? No, I agree with like, that. Why do people say why did you charge so little for your shows? I'm like, well, but that's isn't that nice? Like, I don't know why is that such a weird thing. <laughs> I like, agree with that, and yeah. and I don't think it's weird, but I do think it's unusual because I think lots of people. Well, you uh, are, more, it, you know. are more apt to just say, oh, well, that's not how it's done. Obviously, everybody else is doing it this way. Or they'll say, oh, that would be nice if that could work. But clearly it doesn't because no one else does it. So I'll charge $20 for the show because I can. Because that's what the value is in the market. You right. Know, that's well, what, first off, I don't, believe, I don't believe in the concept of what the market will bear. I could yeah. give a fuck about that. Yeah. And um, uh, I mean, the whole time... People have been saying you can't do this, and nobody ever asked why. Why can't you? Like, why not? Yeah. So I think I always ask why not. Mm-hmm. Um, I can remember when Fugazi first started playing, and people we were we were doing these five dollars shows, and people said, yeah. "Well, yeah, you can start like this, but you won't be able to do this in like in a year from now." And I thought, well, "Why not? You know, why why wouldn't you be able to?" I think mostly people just never they never tried. If Fugazi were to play a show tomorrow, would you charge more than five dollars? Given that in, the prices for everything have inflated, I mean, the issue with this now is um, not. It's not so much about the inflation. Yeah. The problem is second the secondary ticket market. Yeah, that's See, crazy. If Fugazi was not, I suspect if Fugazi was to play a show, a lot of people would want to see us, and therefore it would be a hot ticket. Mm-hmm. And um, if in order if twenty people wanted to see it, sure, I charge five dollars. Fuck, you know, Amy and Joe and I just played a show, and it was free. Yeah, donation. I have no problem with that whatsoever. How many people came to that? Five hundred people. <laughs> How much was donated? Five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So that's pretty good. Yeah, it worked out good. Um, Ten dollars a head, right? Mm-hmm. There was no no expenses. We had our own PA, and the room was free. Um, but uh, and that all went to this um, soup kitchen called Loaves and Fishes. And um, so, to answer your question, would I? Yeah, I would. But the problem is, how do you sort out the, the secondary market? Because if you're a popular band, then suddenly the way like people will just re still buy. 50 tickets mm-hmm. and then sell them for $200 each or mm-hmm. something. I mean, this is a, it's a problem. It's, it's, a, it's something to think about, but I don't have to think about it really. I mean, occasionally as an, I mean, cause I'm a logistical guy. Like yeah. I like, I'm a lot, I like to work out the logistics. So occasionally I might sit down and think about like, how could Maybe that Maybe you work? can sell it on the discord website. So what? Sell tickets. Yeah. But then you have to prove that the person yeah. is showing up. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's anyway, I don't, but it's not a problem for me at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, and I, I think that, um, I mean, it's, it's an inter- entertaining thing to kick around. And if you and I were sitting drinking tea, yeah. then maybe it would be something to talk about, but I don't really no point because I'm not, we're not going to yeah. play a show it's sort of, it's a hypothetical. Speaking of being a logistical guy, did it seem like you had a natural aptitude for understanding how to run the logistics of a record label, like how to distribute them out into the world? how to make sure that enough money is coming in to keep the company going and enough is going out and all that kind of thing. Hiring, firing, all that when kind of stuff. When you first get a skateboard, it's just a piece of plastic or wood 
with some wheels on it, and yeah. you don't really know what to do with it. But what you do is you step on the board, yeah. and you realize it rolls, and then you realize it rolls faster on a hill that's going down a hill than on a flat, and certainly faster if you're trying to go up a hill. And if you then you start finding ways to turn by leaning, and you know that's the way you learn. And the same yeah. way with the record, I didn't know shit about a record label except that it would made records. Yeah, and then I knew, but I did know that if I made a bunch of records, I could sell them to my friends, and then there was local stores. And then Skip probably told us about a distributor, and we called them up, and they took some. But I remember going to stores and saying, well, some to you, we're selling teen idols for a dollar each. And I remember one place in Boston once said, like, oh, you know, can we take five on consignment? Yeah. And I don't live in Boston. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm not going to be able to pick up the money. Right. And I said, it's five bucks, dude. Like, buy five. And then he's like, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if he did buy them. But I'm not going to do consignment with somebody in Boston. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So there, so in other words, it's practical. Yeah. Like, I'm just practical. So I think I look at the situation. I, I the same think, way with I see what you're saying. Like with skateboarding, like well, some I might start out like, like, this is a steep hill. Yeah. I think I can ride this hill. And then if I come to the bottom of the hill, I see that like, there's like a, um, a, a very busy avenue. I'm like... I won't go down this hill. That's just fucking it's simple logic. That's the way I approach yeah. everything. It's just okay. look at the situation and figure it out. Yes, when you get a skateboard, it's just a piece of wood with some wheels on it. But then there are some people, say like Tony Hawk, that are able to, over years, a period of years, take it to a, a new level and sure. do incredible things with it. And part of that is hard work, but then part of it is also that he happens to have an aptitude or an extraordinary right. you know, talent for it. Would you say that you have a talent for running a business? It seemed like an odd question considering I've had the label, I've been running the label for 38 years. Yeah. So I think the answer is pretty clear in the put, like the proof's in the pudding. I mean, to some degree, it's not a great, I mean, Depending on how you mean by, like, do I know how to run a business? I guess so. Could I well, have a business? Well, if the function of the business is to put out art that you like and get it out into the world. Right, for me, it's yeah. very successful. Yeah. I don't yeah. have any problem with it. But there, I can remember once this, this um, there was a hip-hop kind of production guys came by, and they were really, they'd heard about the label, and they were really curious to see how we did things. So I was showing them around, there's a bunch of guys who are young, and they were, and I showed them around the label, showed them the offices, and showed the, blah, blah, explained the distribution and stuff. And finally, we were all talking. At the end, the guy says, "Like, so how do you get paid?" And by that, he meant like, "How do you make a lot of money?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Oh, you don't get paid." And they're like, "Oh, well, that's weird." Like they didn't. That that's just the point. Like if money is not your object, then there's a lot of things, a lot more things are possible. Mm -hmm. But if you have to make money, then it becomes extraction. Mm -hmm. And the thing about extraction is, when you take it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you're making money out of people, you're extracting from them, and then they're gone. But I'm not interested in that. Money is not the point. Yeah. Well, that's obvious. So that's... But that's also probably why you've lasted so long. Yes. That's why I'm telling you, too. Yeah. That it is why I've lasted. So the point being, for most people, they would look at this business and think, like, that's a ridiculous way to run a business yeah. because it's not making as much money as possible. The American concept, sure. the, the capitalist model is to make as much money as possible. That yeah. is the point of it. And like really the corporate model, it is almost like that is the reason for corporations. Yeah. And the way you make the most money possible is you charge as much as you can get and then you drive down your expenses. Mm -hmm. And your expenses by and large, are human beings, cost sure. for human beings. And sure. so then they have to, they get less or less convenient for them. So that's how you, that's the corporate model. That's not my model. This one's ours, let's take it up. 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 Insofar as you're a label that's documenting a local community, you're not without precedent. You know, you take labels like Motown or Sun or Chess or Stax. They were documenting uh, to begin their, with. their communities. Uh, and then but, at some point, they all got sold and conglomerated. And they became a brand. 
You don't consider Discord a brand. No. What's the difference between a brand and a record label? I think the the difference is that a brand is something it represents a lifestyle or something or just something like for instance like if you can make a <clears throat> you know like if you can slap your name on something other item like right a liqueur or a football or whatever you know if you can slap the name and it's supposed to invoke something and make that thing more somehow imbue that particular or a mug. object yes yeah was something or well, mug is a little that's merchandise it's a little bit different <laughs> okay gotcha but um a brand is sort of leads with it's yeah it, it's it creates like this sort of like a um an aura where i guess i feel like for me a record label is actually in service of the music that it's yeah like we i mean i really want to document i want washington dc to be a like you know in the early discord record label the minor threat label there was a slogan like the old record labels used to have slogans on them yeah and we had one that jeff came up with which was putting dc on the map Mm -hmm. which for us was a joke i mean clearly a joke what map in the world doesn't have washington dc on it right it's the capital of the united states which is the most noisy goddamn country in the world right so um so we but what it was but it was a tongue-in-cheek it was tongue-in-cheek because we also we're serious because DC was not on the musical map. Right. Like, name a really well known rock band from Washington, DC in the 1970s. Not counting not- Bad Brain 79, but mid 70s. Right. I mean, I, I was thinking like not rock, but you know, the go go scene was getting but, started. Okay, but yeah, yeah but, but that wasn't yeah. not well known. Yeah. Name, name yeah. something that you would name a band. I can't. I can't. Right. But can you name something from the 80s? Sure. And the 90s? Well, I guess you put it on the map. Boom. That was the idea. But the idea was we were trying, we saw, I mean, in the beginning of punk, it was super regional because punk was an idea that floated over um, the country, um, but it came in a form of records and still photos. So if you wanted to hear punk, you had to form your own band. So each region had, people were forming their own bands. And so because they all drank, they still drank from um, regional wells they had flavor to them so you had a really like the scene in Austin was really specific the LA yeah. was specific San Francisco was specific Reno and Maumee Ohio and Detroit and Minneapolis and Boston everywhere had their own scenes like really specific to their their areas and Washington D.C. also did, you know, and and so in the beginning, I thought that everywhere would have their own label. So you had Danger House and SST doing L.A. You had Alternative Tentacles, um, and um, and then Exclaim Records in Boston, and um, uh, Touch, Touch and Go, go yeah. right in the Midwest, and Twin Tone, and and you know all these you know these different labels, and they were I thought we were all going to like shepherd our individual scenes. And that would be the rep- you say, oh, that's a disco record, that's DC. Oh, that's SST, that's LA. You know, you just, that's what I, in my mind, that's what we are doing. Very shortly thereafter, they just started, everyone just started signing bands from all over the place. And there were, you know, that certainly came up. You sure. Know, Jeff discussed it. I was always wanted to keep it in DC because I thought it would just be so cool. You say, oh, that's Discord, that's DC. You only put out like Reptile House and Lungfish were. A couple of the void or from Columbia. Void, void, yeah. (laughs) So you you mentioned earlier that you you feel like the label is transitioning into kind of a custodial role. Well, it Um, has done. There's no question that. So is that because there are not, uh, you know, there's not like a glut of young bands that you're eager to sign. There's some really nice bands here. Great new bands here. Young. I think what's happened by and large is that there's a bit of a. a culture, a cultural difference that the younger bands, like the way, like you were talking about earlier about people have this sense of what they have to do, like the way you have to do things. And I'm surprised when I hear younger bands talking about like, well, we kind of need to get an agent because we can't get a show and a clubs without an agent. That might be the truth, but as for me as a punk, the response would be like, well, fuck the clubs. Yeah. That's how I look at it, you know? Um, and they, they really want to get a manager because I feel like that's the way you, you need entree to get. But it's all success stuff. Like they're, with their concept of success, which is different than my concept of success. So I feel like it's not a really a good arrangement. because Right. If, you're, if your notion of success is not aligned with the people who 
whose work you're right. serving, it doesn't make right. sense. Right, so we distribute the records through the distribution thing. We're happy to work that way. But the label itself, I just don't think it'd be a good... I think it's too weighted, you know, for the, for the, and also I wouldn't like, I'm not going to, if a band has a manager, I'm not going to talk to the manager. Like no band on discord ever had a manager. Because it doesn't make sense. No. For the way that, the, that it's just not the functions. way we thought about things. Yeah. It'd be yeah. like having a, like, yeah, it'd, you know, it'd be like having a, uh, I don't know, a butler or something. Yeah. I don't know. Instead of weird. talking to your father, you talk to the butler and then he conveys the message or something. Right. I just seems you so know? strange to me that yeah. people would have these, um, these intermediary people. And so we just never, it's just not part of my, my reality. So, Bands now feel like that's important, which is fine. I don't care. I, I mean, I wish they, I wish they would see there's other ways. I mean, I think my work has been largely trying to show not that to do it my way, but that there are other ways it can be done. Yeah, like the infinite possibilities. Well, I think what you've shown is that by doing things your way, it could be empowering in the sense that other people can embrace whatever their way of doing things is right but you can't but then the problem is that people think oh i want to do that and they come and they're like oh but there's no money here. i can't yeah. make a living from this and they're like right that wasn't the idea the idea wasn't to make a living from your music like the idea was to make your music mm-hmm. this is a different idea like black flag there's an interview i gotta find this goddamn interview somewhere it was a black flag interview and one of them i think it was dukowski this is 80 or 81 he said i'd rather work a day job for the rest of my life than ever be dependent on my music and that really resonated with me. Mm-hmm. Like, I never want to make music to make money. Mm-hmm. So people say, well, yeah, it's easy. But look at you. You do. I mean, that's not true. Like, we manage. We booked. I booked the fucking bands. I booked Fugazi. You know, like, I, we, like we work. Yeah. We work, work, work. We drove. We load. We do the work. Yeah. We do all that work. We do everything. We put out the record. We do all the work. And we do all the work because then the music is free. Not everybody has that aptitude that you have, that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, lots of artists don't. I think yeah. it's you're you're also an outlier in that sense because I would say, you know, lots of people that are intensely creative can't get their shit together in a business sense or can't like manage yeah, their life. That's true. Um, so, I, you know, I, I would I'm say I'm not critical of other no, people. No, I'm not saying it. that. Yeah, I'm, I, sure I'm not, not saying that, but I'm just saying that, that I'm pushing when other people about, perceive. I'm, right, the, but I'm pushing back on the notion. Yeah. When I say like I don't want to be dependent on my music, people are like, "But you do, you are." But I'm, but my point is, that I work, right? Like I'm work. I'm not playing music right now. I'm working right now. This yeah. very moment, I'm working. That's what I'm doing right now because this theoretically will be put on the internet or somewhere, and people will it's hear content, it. man. It's, right, it's and some then content. people will hear it, and they'll be like, "That's kind of interesting." Maybe I'll check that shit out. You know? Yeah, I don't know. That's like, but to me, that's my work, and you know, I'm, I just. I've always done the work. To me, irrespective of, of whether this even goes on the internet, it's helping organize thoughts in my head that are going to affect the work, right. the exactly. music that I make, and, and that's all that the kind point. of thing. That's why I made music to be in a room with people. Yeah, like the conversation that could ensue. Yeah, but you have to have a point of gathering. Music is like a fire, right? You know, and you can gather close. You know, you can cook on it, or you can be warm by it. Mm-hmm. You might something might come of it. It's like nutritious or it might just be something that makes you feel like connected and alive Mm -hmm. but either way it's a point of gathering you know Mm -hmm. that's sort of the and for me like the idea of being able to have to create the music um that is part of that that to have this sort of communal experience that i yeah that is that is why i do my work but i like also like to work so i don't mind i don't have any problem with working um why do you like to work because you meet people. Mm-hmm. Like, if, you know, it's interesting. I went to um, Brazil with um, the first time I was base tech for L7. I was very good friends with them, and I just, they needed Oh, they, I've had D on this show. Right. So so I went down with them yeah. to Brazil. They It was sort of like I was a base tech because mostly uh, Jennifer Finch, who was a bass player in the band, she was needs. Everybody else had their partners going with them to be drum tech, guitar techs, whatever. And she was like looking for someone to be a friend who could be a bass. I said, I'll go. Mm-hmm. So I went down. It was like Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, L7, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. We played one show in Sao Paulo, one show in Rio. And it was full five-star hotels and like, you know, shuttle buses. And you'd be in the hotel and you go take them to the stadium and you play the show and you come back to the hotel. And then you get 
shuttle to the airport and you've flown and you, you, you always shuttled around. Um, and then when Fugazi went back two years later or a year later, um, we went down. I said to the guy, this guy, Marcos Bafo, is bringing us to Brazil and he wants to play one show in Belo Horizonte in the mm -hmm. north. And uh, he said, I said, well, we want to play other places. What do you want to play Rio and Sao Paulo? I said, we want to play everywhere. And I said, we don't, we want to play the small towns. We want to go play. Because then when you go play, you have to get there. And you have to get there, like, suddenly, like, Fugazi, like, we're in a pickup truck. It was, like, a, owned by a small village. It was, like, their civic pickup truck with a eight, it could fit eight people in the cab. Um, and we put all the gear in the back, and a guy named Machete was driving who didn't speak English and we had to drive from some from um, Belo Horizonte down to this village called Itabari and you had to drive through the rainforest um, and we had all of our gear in the back of this pickup truck and I said to this I said to the translator I said to Machete I was like shouldn't we get a tarp because well, it's not going to rain I go we're driving through a rainforest and he's like oh yeah so we had to stop at a hardware store <laughs> and buy plastic to cover it up um, that's the kind of shit I love. Right. Because when you actually engage that's, with that's, things, yeah. you interact with people. Well, that's the traditional function of music for the vast majority of the history of uh, humankind, right? I is agree. to Music is to connect people. Right. That's the purpose of it. Right. And this is where the marketplace was so, you know, and, and not just mar music. Well, I've said this many times. Music is the form of communication that predates language. Yeah. So... It is, there's what music is, the essence of it is so much higher than anything else that we're talking about here. But the industry, along with religion and nationalism and other things, have f realized the power of music and, and have war. Glommed on. Yeah, yeah. They've yeah. glommed on. And yeah. they've, so music, you know, I can say that like music can be entertaining, but it's not merely entertainment. Mm hmm. But many people think it is because they are they they are coming from the American notion of the corporate notion, you know. Music may lift your spirits, but it's not merely spiritual. Right. Right. You know, and music may stir within your heart a sense of national pride, but it's not national. It's not. Yeah. Na it's, these are things. It's much much deeper than all those things. And that's the music I'm interested in. I'm not saying that I pr I practice that. I'm saying that's my ideal. To, yeah. to, 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 to engage with music on that level. Yeah. And it doesn't preclude you from engaging with it on other levels. Not at all. You know? I said it's entertaining. Yeah. Or it could, or it could feel spirit. Like some, yeah. yeah, some days I want to eat like a healthy kale salad, and yeah. some days I want to eat potato chips or a Coca-Cola, you know? So it is what a, it is. Yeah. The world is your oyster. Is there anything that you're excited to try that you haven't tried yet? In terms of? In your life. I often wish I could make... I could make food, like I could just I would have that oh, bread yeah. and just cook and be. I wish I had that thing where I'm. I like that idea of because food is another higher form. Yes. Of, of gathering. Yes. And, and, and it's been so abused by the marketplace now, and I keep thinking about how I've, that I I do often think I wish I could engage. I could find that Sex Pistols moment with food where i would have this new understanding and a grasp of how to approach it in a way that would subvert most people's way of thinking about it but mm. also to do it for the reasons that it should be done sure which is nutrition nutritional you know like healthy nutritional um loving and um a a, a reason to gather and to take care of people, that's music and food. I'm, I'm. So I think that. Am I excited about it? I would. I don't excite. I don't give a fuck about it being excited. Well, that's one of my favorite things to do is cook for people. Good. So you understand so yeah. that's something I don't do. I don't like. I, I made some toast for a friend of mine this morning. That was nice. Um, I like drinking tea with people, but I often think, oh, I'd like. To, I would like to. If if we're talking about things, not excited. Okay, I don't think about excited, but because you don't get excited. No, not really. I actually don't either. <laughs> I think it's the terminology. I think it's like I'm speaking in the modern vernacular, right? But you're speaking in a vernacular that's been foisted upon you. Okay. I'm not. This is not a critique of you. It's just no, a critique of our society. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we use words that the words themselves 
um, push it into an artificial, like we don't hear it, mm-hmm. but they push it into an artificial construct. Yeah. Like instead, and, and, and a dishonest one in a weird way. Not that you were being dishonest, but no. literally, like. I How would like, you ask that same question then? If, if you were speaking to somebody and you wanted to know if there were things that they hadn't tried yet that they would like to try. I think if I was in doing it, first of all, I'm not, I don't do a lot of interviews. So if I was interviewing somebody, I'm not sure if I would ask that question in an interview because it seems to be a little bit like one, of, like a leading, like it seems, um, it's one of those kind of like conversation you would have with a, a dreamer conversation or something, which I'm, which yeah, I don't mind having with a friend or somebody I'm going to chat with, but in terms of an interview, it's, it seems like not really a question I would ask. What question would you ask to conclude the conversation then? Because then I'll ask you that. Well, can I finish answering your yeah, first yeah, question? Yeah. <laughs> You've got to stop. You cut me off every time, dude. Um, so, but if I was to ask you, if you and I were talking, yeah, and you said something that made me think that you were unsatisfied and that there were things in your life that you really wanted to do, if you had somehow intimated that to me somehow, through what you were talking about or your body language or I had this sense of that, I might say to you, are there other things that you want to do in your life that you haven't done yet that you want to do? I might say that. But it would only be as a result of me feeling that you somehow felt unsatisfied. Do I strike you as unsatisfied? I don't know. I, that's why I asked. Well, you actually you, strike me as pretty satisfied, but I, I also know that... I'm not privy to your internal world, so that's why I would ask a question like that. Right, and that's and so for me, this is where the area of like it's interesting because like in interviews, I think there's like a um, there's different kinds of interviews. I think that I'm I don't mind being honest about stuff, but like I don't I'm not like in terms of interviews, I don't like the tr- to be uh, truthful with you. I don't think I'm not excited about things. I don't. It's not the way I am. Mm-hmm. I just I am what you see, like you know. And um, I might be a you know, like for instance, like we were talking about Mary Timoney earlier, and yeah, and I really love Mary. So like maybe at some point we're like, oh, we should get together and have a cup of tea, and I would be looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. That makes me happy. I like that. I like talking to people. Mm-hmm. I like spending time with people. Um, maybe I would be, I don't know if I'd be excited about it. Um, I don't get it. Yeah, I'm not really, I don't get, I'm not really getting an excited kind of guy. But I like, I love people. I love doing things. Um, I wake up basically every morning with too much to do that, I, and I want to do it. So that's okay by me. Do you think, are, are you thinking when you wake first wake oh, up, yeah. are there a flood of thoughts? Yeah, I go to sleep on a dime, boom, and I might I could sleep five hours, but as soon as my brain is on, it's on. It's, mm-hmm. it's not going off. I'm merely thinking about I could be like writing a song on one part of my brain and solving another problem on that side. My just on. I fully engaged in the morning. I'm I get up early. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow, sometimes it's five thirty in the morning. I'll be up. Mm-hmm. Just I love it. My brain just wheeling away. It's constructive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no problems. I like it. I like you know. I mean, I, I do worry. If I go through like you know, there was a period, probably I don't know, some maybe a year. Or I don't know how long where I was sleeping. I never slept more than five or six hours, and I've, I sometimes worry that I should sleep more. Because I do think you got to put the books away at some point. But having said that, I'm not. I wasn't tired. So I talked to a, uh, a doctor and I said, so what do you think? And they said, do you feel tired? I said, no. I said, well, then that's how much rest you need. Yeah. You know, but that might be also because I don't, my body chemistry is different because of the way I, what I put in my body over the years. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I have no idea how the whole thing works. I just, just, yeah, as I said, just do what's in front of me. Well, yeah, it seems like you're the kind of person that wants to be awake and engaged as much as possible and doesn't want to forget <laughs> I like sleeping though. Yeah. Actually, I will say that my life is dreams have been. Um, my life, like, I used to tour a lot. 
Yeah. So I was always going into the moment, right? I'm always going out into the world and every day with the different circumstances, waking up somewhere else and having to get from here and then there's the ferry broke down, blah, blah. There's so many different things going, things problem solving constantly, you know, so much activity, um, millions of moving parts and always changing. And I loved it. But in my life, I haven't been out of the country in 10 years. Oh no, shit, 12 years now. I've been out of the country. I've toured a little bit with Amy, but not a lot. Don't do a lot of traveling. My life is very much like we have a kid and we're super, we have our, our groove. And I've found that in recent years, my dreams have become insane, like really colorful, crazy stuff going on all the time. And I've started to wonder if maybe it has something to do with my sort of the root not predictable exactly, but the routine of my life, maybe my brain is offloading. Like it, when I dream, it's things are so, I have such a vivid, vivid dream with so much stuff going on. Not bad dreams, just full on. Like, you know, I wake up like, wow, that was quite a dream. Do you remember everything? No. No. But I remember tonally. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing about remembering things. Like I said to you earlier about lyrics. I don't really know lyrics. That's true. I really don't know lyrics. I barely know my own lyrics. But once I get the first syllable out of my mouth, if I'm in holding my body in the right place, right. it'll follow. I know every... I'll, it just comes right out of me. Music for me, I think, is... Like I, like, I write music all the time. I'll pick up a guitar and just write something. And at some point, we'll organize... I or we will organize those, those somethings into a shape that it becomes a song. And I know what that song is about, but there's no words. I know what it's about, but I can't put it into words because it's not, it's not in English or any other language. I don't speak any other language to speak of, but it's not, what the song is about is something I can't put into words. However, at some point, I want to make, put this song into the world. I want to share it with people. And I want them to get a sense of what the song is about. <laughs> so I organize and shape the sounds of my mouth using words the same way I'm doing right now. Because what I'm communicating to you right now is two things. One is the intellectual shapes of the sounds that are registering sure. in your brain and you're hearing and you're putting you're reconstructing as a sentence and you're getting the gist of what I'm trying to put across. The other communication is a different form. It's a it's a series of sounds that gives you a sense of like this guy's thinking or or we're having this is a we're having an exchange here that's that's resonating with you know that that's the other we're beeping at each other. That's what we do, right? We beep, we bark, we you know we do these things, we make sounds. But humans, because of our stupid brains, we organize, we shape the sounds to make them into some intellectual exercise as well. So if I have to write words for my song, then I've shaped those sounds into something that hopefully will represent, to me, like if not what exactly this series of sounds is about, at least it will represent the significance of what the, these or these sounds are about for me. Do you follow that at all? Yeah, absolutely. I think about that a lot, and I think on it, about it on lots of different levels. Yes. You know, I think that's kind of what we are. When we say we're a person, what, what does that even mean? Right. You know, we're a collection of atoms on one level, but then that's representing something else on a deeper level. And right. then on another level, there is no discrete objects anyway. It's right. all just one thing. It's all one thing. Well, Ian Mackay, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> Good luck with that shit. Words, words and the Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Oh,